Would everyone please take their seats? Prior to our recess, the previous question was called. I now ask unanimous consent that we withdraw the previous question and uh, the, without objection so ordered. Does any member seek recognition to offer an amendment? The gentleman from, uh, what, for what reasons the gentleman from Vermont rise? The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the report offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont. The gentleman is recognized to uh, uh, explain his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment, uh, which has it been distributed? I, I'll, do you want me to wait? Uh, no, you can, you can do it. Uh, explain it as it is being distributed. Uh, the, the thrust of my amendment, Mr. Uh, Chairman, goes to points that I was making earlier about the, from my perspective, uh, limited scope of the investigation that the committee has done uh, that doesn't uh, it, it include as comprehensive an approach to what happened uh, in the predecessor uh, gun running oper gun walking operations in the uh, in the, the Bush administration the McKay uh, the McKay uh, administration of the Justice Department and what this does is call on the uh, committee to postpone action on contempt until that investigation is done. My member would add language to the report that explains that proceeding to contempt at this time, in my view, uh, as expressed in this amendment, uh, is unwarranted because we have not as a committee done the investigation uh, that needs to be done in order to establish a credible basis for the committee to take what will be historic action. Uh, a, a, a request for contempt of a sitting uh, United States Attorney General, first time in the history of our country that will be done. And as I mentioned, I say that as a, a member of the committee uh, who's a strong supporter of the efforts of the committee, including when it's led by a Republican chair, uh, to get to the bottom of issues that affect the public interest. And as a strong supporter of the use of the subpoena power of this committee, whether it's being presented by a Republican or Democrat, to get access to all the information that we have. But on the other hand, I do think the committee has a responsibility to do as thorough an investigation as a predicate to asking for the contempt uh, citation. That's number one. Number two, somehow, some way, uh, and I, a lot of people on this committee are trying to do this, by the way. Uh, I thought uh, many of the remarks from my colleagues were, were very compelling. Uh, if there is any chance to get to a bipartisan uh, approval of an unprecedented action, it is going to give some peace of mind, I think, to the American public that this is us in pursuit of our duty uh, and it will limit some of the questions about whether it is a partisan motivation. So uh, I think this uh, is appropriate. I, I would much, I'd feel much more secure, and I think a lot of us would, uh, if the work in this committee had been more inclusive of the origins of this operation that occurred in the previous administration. Uh, this point, I think, has been made by our ranking member. Uh, Mr. Cummings issued a 95-page staff report that was based on a very thorough review of the evidence. Uh, that report documents how fast and furious was actually the fourth in a series of operations over five years that were run by the ATF field office in Phoenix. So this is not something that is new. Uh, there is a lot of questions about how much high officials at the DOJ knew about it, but it had been going on before this for at least five years. And the committee has obtained documents showing that in 2007, uh, well, I'll leave that. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate the urgency that this committee has uh, under your leadership to try to get to 
access to all the information that it feels it needs. But what I also believe is that the committee should be doing as much of a comprehensive investigation that goes back through both administrations to get to the bottom of this, to get to the truth, which is the common goal we share. Number two, we should do this in a way that establishes the absolute uh, foundation of credibility before we ask this Congress to take an action that will be for the first time in the history of this country uh, that we ask Congress to hold the sitting attorney, United States Attorney General in contempt. Uh, now, I know there is a dispute also as to how cooperative the Attorney General is. In the view of some, not very, but in the record of eight different appearances before Congress, the production of thousands of pages of documents and emails, uh, that is not a defense to not providing everything that we legitimately can ask, uh, but it is a relevant factor in terms of whether or not there is an ability to get to an agreement. Uh, the final point here is that you raised a good question about privilege log, Mr. Chairman. I happen to think if there is going to be withholding of documents with the assertion of some kind of privilege, then we are entitled to a log. I agree with that. Uh, but so much has happened since last Friday where the nature of the subpoena was significantly changed that I do have a question as to do we really have to do this now or does it make sense to take a little bit more time uh, to try to work this out in a way that meets uh, the committee requirements uh, but stop short of what is going to be an unprecedented action. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, I will yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I might note that we, we, low, we, we restricted to less items on the subpoena. So anytime you, you have to answer less, there is nothing new to decide. We have limited it down to just one item. So I would hope that everyone would understand we didn't change what we were asking for. We narrowed it as to what would be considered for contempt. Uh, I will make one pledge to you, Mr. Wells. Regardless of your amendment, regardless of the contempt vote, I am not done looking at justice, and I am sure that Mr. Grassley is not done looking at justice and alcohol, tobacco, and fire for the serious reorganization that will be necessary to prevent this and other misconduct from occurring in the future. So you have my pledge, regardless of what happens here today, that we are not done uh, with trying to get it right at ATF. Okay, thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. <coughs> what purpose, uh, the gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I rise in opposition to this amendment. I have the greatest of respect for the gentleman from uh, Vermont. I know he stands on principle. He's passionate about this country and, and wants truth and justice in all ways. I, 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 again, have the greatest respect for him. But I, I, I do stand in opposition to this amendment. Uh, this has been going on for a long time. Um, and I would also uh, cite the actual contempt items. As we, we look at the subpoena that was issued uh, back in October, I would point to item number one. Uh, I would also point to items number two, number four, and number five, where the request for information uh, from the Department of, uh, of Justice was not limited to just Fast and Furious. In fact, it says all communication relating to Operation Fast and Furious, this is uh, under point number one, the Jacob Chambers case or any organized crime drug enforcement task force firearms trafficking case based in Phoenix, Arizona, to or from the following individuals. Uh, on number two, it says, at the latter part of it says, referring to or relating to Operation Fast and Furious or any other firearms tracking, uh, trafficking case. Point number four, all documents and communications referring or relating to instances prior to February 4, 2011, where the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, firearms and explosives failed to interdict weapons that had been illegally purchased or transferred. Again, not a limitation on just fast and furious. Number five, all documents and communication referring to related to instances prior to February 4, 2011, where ATF broke off surveillance of weapons and subsequently became aware of those weapons entering, entered Mexico. As Representative Gowdy pointed out in his testimony, our, our, our concern here is about gun walking. And, and the concern with the, uh, the moving forward of the subpoena today, or this uh, contempt order today, is to get the Department of Justice to provide this committee the documents that it needs to get to truth and justice, to make sure this never, ever happens again. The President said in March of 2011, and I concur and a lot of other members concur, 
that justice has to have, that we have to hold people accountable and make sure that we make the changes necessary so that it never, ever happens again. Now, we, we, so to say that we are going to put this off so we can get at Attorney General Michael McCasey um, is a different issue. It is a different issue. I am committed to work with you and to others to get to the bottom of gun walking. It was wrong then. I wasn't here. It was wrong then, but it's wrong now. And the idea that the, this Obama administration, the Department of Justice, continued to propel it forward is just fundamentally wrong. And it, it, if the Department of Justice is right when they make the assertion that the senior levels of the Department of Justice were not involved, they didn't know about it, they didn't authorize it, they didn't, I disagree with that assertion based on all the documents I've seen. But if that's their case, then why not hand us the documents? And why is it that President Obama is suddenly invoking executive privilege on documents that they were told yesterday they would be glad to give us. That doesn't really add up. There's something here that we need to know about. It should have been disposed of last year. We've been exceptionally patient. I think Chairman Issa has been over backwards to be accommodating. But we still have a duty, a responsibility to follow through on our responsibility, regardless of party, to get to the bottom of this to make sure that it never happens Would again. Would the gentleman I, yield? Yes. For a question. Um, did you just say that the that in the negotiations last night the Attorney General indicated that they would provide the documents? So now you're asking why they would some of the issue documents. executive some of, some of the documents. Some of the documents. Yeah. Well but can't you understand why the White House would ultimately move to protect the Attorney General with an executive privilege claim? when it realized that irrespective of the willingness to provide such documents, which you have just said, we were going to move forward with a contempt citation nonetheless. No, that, it, reclaiming my time, that, that is not too, true. It is inaccurate. When we first started, we issued this subpoena. We came later to, to light that there were some 70,000 documents out there that had been uh, being reviewed by the IG, which, by the way, we still haven't seen the IG's report. Week before last, in the Judiciary Committee, uh, Attorney General Holder said there are 140,000 documents out there. So this committee has been given less than 8,000 of what the Attorney General said week before last are, are 140,000 documents. And until they actually will articulate specifically why they should not be given, given those uh, to this committee, remember the President said he didn't know about this. The President said he, had no, he was not involved, but now suddenly literally 15 minutes before we're starting this hearing, he suddenly comes to the conclusion that, well, maybe I should invoke executive privilege, which under my understanding means that he somehow was personally involved. I think that begs more questions than it answers. It's disappointing that it has to happen in this late hour. This committee has been pursuing this uh, for 14 months uh, plus, and uh, we deserve some answers. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to go to Mr. Welch. First, first of all, I Support the uh, support the amendment, but Mr. Welch, let me um, tell you that in the letter that the the um, chairman uh, entered into the record this morning, one from uh, Mr. Cole, Deputy Attorney General, um, one of the things they refer to is a letter of June 13th uh, from uh, Chairman Issa. And in that, and they say that in that letter, uh, it says the committee is now that committee. They said that the committee is now focused on documents from after February fourth. You understand? They got a letter a week ago, mm -hmm. right? Saying spotlight. This is what we're spotlighting. All right. Now, you know, when you you talked about um, the things changing. Things did change. They became narrower. And so the focus was on, on, on became the February, post February 4th documents. That is, the ones that would go to um, retaliation against employees if there was such. So, in a way, you know, and then you talked about um, how. Um, privilege logs and things of that nature. You got to remember, in a way, I understand what the chairman is saying, but in a way, the, the goalposts did change a little bit. Right. But, and it changed 
13, a week ago. Right. And this whole privilege log thing, you've got to actually go through the documents. You know, in other words, you've got to focus on that stuff. The Attorney General has said all along that he was willing to, uh, to, to provide documents, but also he needed time to do that. Um, the other thing I want to go back to what Mr. Chavis just said is that, you know, this Attorney General is the one who said that th these tactics must come to an end. Uh, they weren't brought to an end under McCasey. This Attorney General s said they must come to an end. And this Attorney General also asked for the IG investigation. Um, and, and, and there's something going on here that, that really should, should bother all of us. And that is, is that, you know, we do have an Attorney General who, just like we did, swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And it seems to be a presumption that when certain privileges are asserted, certain um, concerns are raised by the Attorney General with regard to deliber deliberative uh, documents, things that go on between staff and things that have traditionally been privileged, that suddenly he has to be hiding something, that he has to be dishonest. Um, and I think we do have to respect the separation of powers here. And so, you know, this whole idea, everybody, ah, oh, what's he hiding? Well, I don't think he's hiding a damn thing. I think what he's trying to do, and he said this during our meeting with him uh, yesterday, he made it clear that this was his watch and that there are certain mm -hmm. things that attorney generals protect as a, as a part of this office, not of Eric Holder, but this office. And he said that he's going to protect those things, but at the same time try to accommodate the committee. Um, you know, it's easy to presume the negative, but maybe, just maybe, uh, the Attorney General is trying to do what Attorney Generals have traditionally done, but at the same time tr try to work with the committee to accommodate the committee. And I would recommend to, to everyone that you take a look at the letter that was sent today because he basically lays out in that letter uh, what his efforts have been, what he will continue to do. And going back to the chairman, um, I know that no matter what the vote is today, that uh, the attorney general will continue to try to work with this committee to, to make things work. Uh, and so that we can do our job, and so that he can do his job. He's got a job, too. And, um, and I respect that. I, 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 I listened to him the other day, yesterday, and, you know, it was clear to me that he wanted to try to work things out to, 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 do, that, to do that balancing. And um, I would hope that, uh, that no matter what happens in this vote, that we would uh, continue to work with him so we can get the information that we need. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Do you recall yesterday that he said if we vote contempt, that's the end of it, there will be no more cooperation? I think he said, he said, no, 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 no. I, don't, I don't remember him saying that. I think in a heated moment, and I've got to tell you, Mr. Chairman, sometimes sitting in a meeting with you can be rough. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, in a heated moment. Yeah, uh, yesterday he, I didn't yeah. think it was particularly heated. And, uh, oh, no, see, you thought it wasn't heated. I did. It was very heated. And um, I think he said something to the effect that it would be, things would be difficult. But I think when you look at the letter today after having, a, a night to rest over it. He's, you know, I mean, this letter I think is, says very clearly, you know, I want to work with you. And, and so. Uh, and I certainly hope so. Yeah, too. I hope so too. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, on, this, um, on this thought that this is something new that was just thrown out recently, in October of last year, we dictated out 22 different categories. Those have since been narrowed down to one. This was one of those categories that was given in October of last year. January the 31st, the Chairman wrote to the Attorney General of this year asking for those same documents. He also sent him a Valentine card on February the 14th asking for those same documents again. So while it's easy to say this didn't come up until last week and there's no way he can get it together, it's hard to imagine getting, a, getting the subpoena last October getting a letter in January, getting a letter in February, finally we can't get to the point to say 
it's time to turn these things over. Even if he just got it Friday, he would have time to turn over two documents. So far, he's given us all of zero documents related to this. So th th this is not something I'm just in a hurry. I couldn't get to it. Uh, this is a systematic stalling, delaying, I'm not going to turn over documents. Now, I, I do want to mention a couple things with this as well. This Attorney General and this DOJ has been more than willing to turn over documents related to the previous administration. In fact, immediately started throwing out things related to wide receiver, even when they're not requested. So uh, to bring in a former Attorney General, fine, we can get a chance to do it, but the role of the Oversight and, and Reform Committee is to deal with oversight of current administrative actions and to try to reform current policies. Now, I know we want to try to relive everything from the Bush administration, and this amendment, while I don't believe it's the gentleman's intent, smacks of it's Bush's fault. And so the Fast and Furious is not Obama's fault. Fast and Furious is Bush's fault because this started somehow in the Bush administration when they're unconnected. And when you look the two of them side by side, don't give that appearance. I would like to, for us to be able to get to the facts. The reason we initiated Fast and Furious is all the details came out related to Brian Terry's murder. The weapons are there. ATF immediately began blowing the whistle to say this is something we've been trying to shut down in Phoenix but have been unable to do, and now the whole system collapses. So again, it's easy to say Eric Holder shut this down. He absolutely did shut this down after there was a huge public humiliation of the project itself. It's always easy to close things down after you've been humiliated in it. But the reality is we've got to get to the documents to determine what's really there. Now, if we want to go back and relive the Bush days and have hearings over all that, okay, we've got plenty of documents from this administration that they're more than eager to throw anything out on the Bush administration. But we've got to get to the facts here as well. And it's not consistent to say, well, we need all that old data before we can deal with new data. No, we, we've got to have both. And I think we are getting old data. We're just not getting new data. Would my friend yield? I would. Um, would the gentleman from Oklahoma agree that the ranking member actually made a request that, all right, in lieu of a hearing, what if we had a private session with the former Attorney General just for members only so that we could at least have a chance to, to question him? And was it not true that that request was also turned down? So how does that resolve Fast and Furious, and how does that resolve a letter that was sent to us the 4th of February with false information and then retracted in December? If the how does that resolve this particular area of this if, contempt? If the gentleman is asking me a question, I, I think it goes to the heart of, of what you indicated, that somehow the Democrats on this committee were saying, first that, and then only after that do we look at the current administration. That's not the case. Uh, we were more than willing to look at it contemporaneously, and we're even willing to look at it in camera to at least get informed. What were you thinking? How does this relate to the current situation? Sure. Since it passed as prologue, it was the antecedent of this program, I understand. and we Re felt it would help. Let me, let me reclaim my time on that. The, the issue, I, I'm sure this is about to come up because my understanding is the next amendment that's coming is uh, dealing with the former director, acting director of ATF. We had two full days of private meetings with him, and now there's a call to also have a public meeting. So while your comment there about uh, let's have a private meeting and, and that'll be enough on it, uh, apparently is not enough with the acting director of ATF that we're dealing with. Would, would the but gentleman it, it still, yield? It still comes back to the basic issue of this doesn't resolve what he's in contempt for. Yes, I'd yield to the chairman. Absolutely. I, I, I might note for, for all of us that uh, the 24 interviews effectively dep depositions were bipartisan, and all members are able to come to them. Uh, in general, members do not choose to go to them. They're done by our career staff, attorneys on both sides. But uh, I would uh, commend to all of you that if you read those 24 interviews, you'll find out our staff asked tougher and more uh, exhaustive questions of every one of those witnesses than I have ever seen asked from the dais. Right, that you back. I thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from New York. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. But in, in this narrative, I, I, I would like to point out that the Attorney General was called before this committee and this Congress nine times to testify, but the head of the ATF wasn't called once. And uh, 
possibly because it doesn't fit into the narrative, uh, because what he had to say is that he didn't know anything about it and that he didn't tell anybody about it at, at, at the Justice Department. But I, I think the point that the AG was here nine times, but the guy who's the head of the ATF, and this was an ATF program, wasn't even called here once. And I, I just feel that that's a glaring unfairness and a glaring uh, uh, yeah. disproportionate focus on one area as opposed to getting the full picture. Well, will the gentleman, will the gentleman will you yield? Yield? Yes, I will. Oh. I, I just might, might want to point out, I've looked at the record of all nine of those appearances. The Attorney General appears before appropriations for purposes of money, judiciary for a broad array of oversight. I will note that he occur, appeared here one time, which was the one time, to my knowledge, that he appeared in which he knew the subject would be fast and furious. And I appreciate his presence here and would note that, uh, that in fact, uh, until today, I thought we were fairly exhaustive with, uh, with the former ATF uh, acting director uh, because of those two days he testified, uh, as it appears that it is not to your satisfaction, although it's not germane to this amendment, uh, I am going to look further at whether or not we can provide additional information uh, as part of getting to the bottom of wide receiver, Hernandez, and every other program that uh, that was also with any similarity similar to Fast and Furious. Reclaiming my time, uh, I, I appreciate the offer of the gentleman and, and chairman to have Kenneth Melson come at, before this body and publicly ad address this to the American public. Uh, I think that would be helpful. I, I would also like to note that the AG was uh, at some of these other hearings. Uh, I do know that um, my colleagues on judiciary said that at the Judiciary Committee meeting he was questioned uh, intensely on Fast and Furious. That's what they told me. I wasn't at the committee, but that's what they told me. Oh, I, uh, I agree so that nine times he showed up and was rec asked questions. Reclaim, reclaiming my time, I, I do believe that, that the uh, AG has turned over backwards to be um, responsive to the chairman and the request of this committee. In fact, the letter of his deputy today says they are open, they want to discuss things further, they want to work this out. <clears throat> and I, I feel that uh, we should be working this out instead of moving to a contempt vote. Would the gentlelady further yield? Uh, I, we've had an exchange of letters. Those letters are all available to the committee. They're open records. Uh, we talked past each other for days. He, the Attorney General in those previous letters was basically offering a briefing. We were asking for documents. Yesterday, undeniably, he brought no documents, no formal offer, no writing, and we walked away, although the ranking member and I may disagree slightly, we walked away with my saying, I'm happy to accept the documents. The documents did not come. We are still prepared to accept documents, and, uh, and I would hope they'd be forthcoming. This letter today says he's asserting executive privilege, so consultation and discussions are all well and good, but they have to lead to something. Yesterday's meeting was a great disappointment to the ranking member I know and to me, but to me it was a, it was a disappointment because he came with nothing but an offer for which he was didn't even bring paper to describe. So. Uh, the frustration of this committee in not getting documents for a year and a half uh, must be satisfied today, and it's the reason that we expect to go to uh, a vote on these amendments and final passage. And I thank the gentlelady. Can we get time? Has You've, my time expired? No, you still have 44 seconds. I'm, I'll, I'll yield to my good friend, Mr. Welsh. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I just want to clarify: my amendment would be an amendment to the text of the uh, report to the House. It wouldn't stop the House from voting, but it would state in the report that the, uh, that the Committee on Government Reform has not uh, had Attorney General Michael McCasey to testify before the Committee or to meet with Committee members informally to discuss the origin and el uh, evolution of gun walking operations since 2006. And documents, of course, obtained during the investigation indicated that Mr. McCasey was briefed personally on the botched efforts to coordinate firearms interdictions. My request in this amendment is to let that information be part of what is presented to the full House so that members are aware of that and can take it into consideration as they make a decision, yes or no, on any motion presented to them. Thank you. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized, Mr. Meehan. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, uh, 
Well, I recognize and appreciate the, the, the good faith uh, effort of uh, my good friend, the colleague uh, from the other side at this point in time. I'm afraid that we may be going down a little bit of a, a, a red herring here one more time. And I think it needs to go to the issue here where, in which we've had substantial testimony regarding the concept of gun walking and the distinction that occurred in the period of time in which things are alleged to have happened during a previous administration and those which have happened during this administration. And so let me first begin by the fact that I have in my hand, you know, a June 18th letter which is now another time in which the current Attorney General has made statements uh, before the Congress and then had to send a letter in which he's retracted those statements. Uh, and, but I think it's important in which he, he said that in previous, the, the previous Attorney General, I mean Michael Mukasey, had been briefed on misguided operational tactics and taken no action in response. And, and, and they could be misguided tactics. But when we heard the testimony of the agents who do this for a living, while they were talking about misguided tactics, the tactics were ones in which the, the concept of gun walking uh, was not alleged for the most part in the conduct during this time, that really what they were talking about is, and it's in here, controlled deliveries, joint investigations and controlled deliveries, in which the same, the question is the continuing oversight and sort of maintenance of that chain of custody. And that is what was happening. Now, they, they, in this concept, some of the things they did was they tried ways to maintain the joint custody, including working with Mexican officials, and lost them. And as a result of losing, notwithstanding their best efforts, they lost the control of those weapons. And that is what is alleged for the most part. Now, my recollection going through the, the extensive report, again, which was largely not germane to the current administration, but an effort to put out everything that had happened before, my recollection there's very few references to anything, although there may be one in which they said actual, you know, gun uh, walking did occur uh, by the ATF in Phoenix. But, but, but there's a, an important distinction as well. What did not happen in the aftermath of that was an approval by the then current United States Attorney. In fact, we have testimony that is in the record in which it is stated that those prosecutions were denied. And they were denied based on those tactics. And so at the conclusion of that administration, what you have is an official position taken in which prosecutorial discretion says those tactics are wrong. What we do have, though, is a new administration that comes in, and there is a revisiting of this issue. And one of the first things they say was, well, how do we approach this question? And they send a prosecutor from Washington to go to the ATF, and that prosecutor begins to revisit all of the tactics, sending a subtle message, in fact, a direct message to the ATF, that now not only are we overruling, in effect, the determination that was made by the then U.S. attorney, which says this is an improper tactic, we're suggesting to you, move it more directly. And then we have in the testimony direct language from that prosecutor that sent memos back to the Maine Justice Department explicitly stating that there were over 300 guns that were walked that are part of this. So we have the knowledge that they know now that guns have been walked, notwithstanding the effort is made in multiple meetings that go all the way up to Lanny Brewer to continue this kind of operation with knowledge in the record that says gun walking. So I think we can spend a lot of time going down a path in which the fact of the matter is in the end we're going to get that there was a distinction and in many ways an irrelevant distinction because what is essence right now is what was the conduct that took place with the oversight of, uh, at the highest levels of the Justice Department in which we have information uh, clearly that there were decisions that were being made which were influenced by directions from this current Justice Department, not the other one. For those reasons, I, I do believe, and again, nobody says it better than the Attorney General. He himself has called back the allegation that it was, you know, that he had been briefed on the misguided taxes and said, you know, no, it was controlled deliveries. It's a subtle distinction, but a very important one. Thank you. The question now occurs.
on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The gentleman requests a recorded vote. Uh, pur pursuant to the rules of the committee, we post this vote is postponed. Does anyone else seek recognition for an amendment? Just, uh, just one point. Mr. Chairman, so that we will, um, because these votes are important, would you announce, tell us now exactly how you plan to proceed with the voting? In other words, so that members can be here timely. We expect to roll until the last amendment, and then we will proceed to the vote. So members are advised not to stray too far. At the current time, we have uh, three amendments pending. Uh, Mr. Lynch, are you choosing to go next? The gentleman is recognized for purposes of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mayor. Uh, I believe I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. And the clerks will please distribute the amendment. Sorry. The Lynch Amendment, insert the following section at the end of the, at the, end of the report. That's unanimous consent. Considered as read without objection. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very simple, straightforward amendment. Uh, basically, it's one paragraph. It says that the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform should provide a complete and itemized accounting of the costs to the American people incurred by the committee, this committee, and any and all agency and departments within the United States Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Department of State in connection with the House investigation of Operation Fast and Furious. Uh, this investigation has now gone on for about 16 months. Uh, there are thousands of, uh, you know, Man and, and uh, council hours that have been put in on this investigation. This is just a straightforward accounting request in terms of what we have spent on this. Uh, it does not reflect the opportunity costs of the from this committee because I, I believe there are there are several dozen other issues we could be focusing on, but we are focusing focusing principally on this. And uh, I just think this would be an important piece of information for uh, the voters to have and for the taxpayers to have in terms of uh, what we're spending our time on while we have a real problem with creating jobs and, and uh, addressing the deficit and some of the other issues that, that the American people think we should be focusing on. Would the gentleman yield? Sure, I'll yield. Um, I join with the gentleman in finding that the amount spent is probably much higher than any of us would have liked. I would note that uh, the, the agencies that we would like to get the information as to how much they spent are not within the power of a contempt uh, motion. However, uh, in the case of our expenditures, although they are in the public record, if the gentleman would withdraw his amendment, I would ask our nonpartisan staff to jointly uh, put together an estimate of hours and time spent of our committee. I apologize, but I can't. I can find no basis well, I, under I, which we could use contempt to order these other time. agencies. Yeah, I, I think that would be that would be accurate if I were amending the the uh, contempt order. I'm actually amending the report uh, in terms of information that we want provided to us. Will the gentleman yield? I will yield. Um, the Attorney General has said that this program was fundamentally flawed. Uh, he also has said that he believes crimes will be committed with these guns that were released purposely into the hands of the cartels for as much as the, the future decade. Is the gentleman suggesting with this amendment that the cost of the Department of Justice to go back and track down those guns uh, be also part of that accounting for what they was botched by the Department of Justice? I think it would look. We want to know what things cost around here uh, on a bunch of di different issues. Uh, this has been a a really uh, Olympic uh, investigation. It's gone far beyond what I think any of us anticipated when this started out. And uh, I, I think the costs are going to turn out to be staggering if we if we look at what these individual departments actually expended in this effort and. I'm just trying to look. I'm trying to balance out what we might get between what we we cost. Uh, and and again, I repeat, this is only a partial accounting of what was what the costs are. There's also the uh, 
the opportunity costs of us grappling with some other issues that are desperately needed to be addressed in this country, and we, we are focusing an overwhelming amount of our time on, on this one issue. And I, just, I would just like to try to have a, a, a balancing out of our expenditures versus uh, the benefits that might be accrued as a result of this investigation. Would the gentleman yield? I certainly would, yes. Thank you. Uh, while there is a tremendous cost involved in this, there are a couple dynamics into it that, that make it difficult in the processing on this. One is we have a border agent that was murdered in this process, and it is difficult to wrap around and to say, gosh, we spent an awful lot of money just investigating one murder and going through that process. So that, that is difficult to wrap around. The, the second thing is obviously the cost dramatically increases as we have back and forth with the administration as they drag their feet to produce documents. That increases our cost. That increases their cost. So that is difficult to evaluate, I would say. Um, and the, the final thing is, it, it, in all of these, uh, I would be interested to know, quite frankly, how much the Department of Justice spent on multiple evaluations of Roger Clements uh, in that hearing. Uh, because we, we have all kinds of things that we look at and go, okay, that Roger Clements hearing, we probably spent way too much money on evaluating. And I agree. We should know that number, and we have it. We have it. We know what the Justice Department spent on that matter. And I'm looking for the same uh, treatment of this case that, that we look at, uh, you know, what has, what has happened here. Uh, this has gone far beyond the investigation of Agent Terry's murder. Right now we're looking, we're trying to crack open the thought processes of, of uh, individuals in the Justice Department and their delibera internal deliberations. So uh, this is far beyond the investigation of that terrible tragedy. Uh, that's, that's the point of, of my inquiry here in trying to get an assessment of what these costs are. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I recognize myself in opposition. Our committee's records are public and available. The other agencies certainly probably will and are certainly welcome to make known their lawyering up, their obstruction, their slow rolling, their not providing what it cost. I would say, however, that the production of documents to us, if they simply gave us carbon copies of most of what they gave, and I'm showing my age with carbon copies, but if they gave us photocopies of the documents they gave to the Inspector General, their cost would be de minimis, basically 80,000 times less than a penny. So I think when you obstruct, it cost. When you cover up, it cost. I, with, since it was noted by Ms. Spear earlier, when we talked, she talked about a 20-minute gap in tapes. Watergate cost a lot of money, but it cost a lot of money because we went to the Supreme Court. We went through a process of a president and an administration that were covering up their actions and covering up basically their involvement, and it rose and it rose and it rose. When this began, this was about Brian Terry's murder in a canyon in Arizona. A simple answer of, yes, we let guns walk on February 4th. Yes, it was a mistake. Perhaps, yes, similar things went on during the Bush administration, and it needs to stop, and we're going to take measures. Would have been much more like the Secret Service's response, or even uh, GSA's response after the uh, Las Vegas uh, item became public. The truth is that on February 4th, this committee was given a false statement. Later, testimony was given that asserted that it was true. As the months went on, there were discussions that went on behind closed doors about how they would or wouldn't tell us that they had given us false statements. Now, I've used the term on occasions lie. I'm not a lawyer. So the difference between giving us false statements and then not retracting them once they knew they were false and lying, or giving something which is false and the truth evolves rather than calling it a lie, is probably technically above my pay grade. But I will tell you, Brian Terry's family deserves every penny we have spent. And if agencies have spent extra money trying to block us, it's caused us to spend more, so be it. In this Congress and the next Congress, with this President and if there's a next President on my watch, we will get to the bottom of dangerous weapons being allowed to go in violation of existing laws into the hands 
of the kinds of people that killed Brian Terry. Well, John, that, you? I certainly will in just a moment. That is something for which I will never question the cost. This committee will report cost, but I will never question the cost of a human life unnecessarily taken, not in the line of duty, but because powerful weapons in good condition, practically brand new, were put in the hands of people who probably wouldn't have had that quality of weapon if not for this program. I yield to the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. If, if indeed we were trying to get to the bottom of what the gentleman's contempt citation uh, targets, we'd be trying to figure out uh, from the ATF uh, supervisor in Phoenix why they provided false information. Uh, to the Justice Department about the gun walking operation that was ongoing. We have decided for some reason to ignore all that. We are not pulling that information forward. I honestly believe if this was about an investigation of, of Agent Terry's death, we would be asking the people who ran this operation in Phoenix, and that directly did uh, lead to the circumstances of, of uh, Agent Terry's death. But what I'm afraid of is that somewhere along the line, during this investigation over the last 16 months, this has become more about the next election now, will the and, less about, will the and less about, no, let me complete my statement. Mr. Isis. With, with all due respect, um, it is my time, so uh, I'll reclaim my time for now. Will the gentleman yield? I would yield to the gentleman. I guess, my, my, Mr. Chairman, I would ask if the gentleman has actually read the wiretap applications. Did to the yesterday. And I found nothing, from my conclusion, read every single one of them, not one statement that the, the uh, Attorney General or anybody in those wiretaps had any information that supported the allegations that you are making. I, I find that, Mr. Chairman, I find that absolutely, totally Each false. and every Station, wiretap. Each time, and every it, wiretap. I have, I have read them, too. And I tell you, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Assistant Attorney General Jason Weinstein, Kenneth Blanco, other people's names are signed on those documents. Well, I can't. And it is crystal clear. It is crystal clear in those in those in, in that information. And it is unfair and unjust to try to come to a conclusion when you haven't seen all the documents. Sure, what I we're have. asking for. No, you have not. What we're asking we for in this committee. What we're asking for in this committee is to see the documents. If it clears the Department of Justice, if Eric Holder didn't know, if the White House didn't know, if the senior people didn't know, then show us the documents and clear this up. But the problem that you have here today is they won't provide the documents. That's why we're here. And you continue to act in ignorance. You cannot do that. That's what this committee is supposed to do, is get the information, make a proper and just conclusion. Uh, I'd, ask unanimous consent, with, I'd ask unanimous consent I have an additional 30 seconds and yield to the gentleman. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. If we really wanted to get to the bottom of this, why not bring uh, the chief of the ATF here before the committee, like we asked on several occasions, the person who is saying that if the gentleman would yield, uh, the weekend of February f of July 4th in 2011, in a bipartisan way over the course of two days, they were interviewed. Those transcripts have been available for nearly 11 months, in fact, closer to 12 months. And if you haven't on this dais read those, that information is here. We did question them. We didn't have an opportunity in this committee, as we have with other witnesses, to, to examine the allegations of that of the head of the ATF in Phoenix. What, what I'm saying with, with the earlier statement regarding the, the wiretaps, that there was nothing there that supported the allegations made about senior officials at Justice knowing what's going on. The gentleman's insinuation that the wiretaps would support that is totally misguided. Totally misguided. Uh, my, and, time, and without, my time has without, expired. Without Does going anyone into seek details about those wiretaps with that? Gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much. I'll yield a minute to the gentleman. Thank you. We have to be cautious because of the privileged nature of the wiretaps, so I can't talk about the contents of those, but I can say after reading those, nothing, nothing in those wiretaps supports what you're, you're alleging. Not a single matter of fact, they refute, they refute everything you're saying. Will the gentleman yield? Certainly. Total the gentleman's time. Fifteen seconds. Oh. 
I totally disagree with it. How do you explain away that Jason Weinstein on October 17, 2010, sent an email to James Trustee that says, quote, do you think we should try to have Larry participate in, uh, have Lanny participate in press when Fast and Furious and Laura's Tucson case are unsealed? It's a tricky case given the number of guns that have walked. How do you, how do you explain we're away? Claiming, we're claiming my have... time. We're claiming my time. Let me uh, say this uh, as I listen to this <coughs> discussion. Um, and I've listened to all the comments today. I've been here every second. And we hear so many comments about Brian Terry. And um, I, I want to make something real clear here. And something that, that is very painful to me. And there's an implication that maybe the people on this side don't care about that family. And that we don't care about the evidence. We, we, we do. We want to get to the bottom of this, too. We made the same commitments. As a matter of fact, when the Terry family came before this committee, it was right after my nephew was, was uh, slain. And I had a conference with him, and I told him, I made a commitment to him that I would do everything in my power to make sure we found out who did this and who's responsible. And I refuse to believe that, I mean, when I read the various documents in this, this um, case, I think some people really screwed up. But I don't think that necessarily folk were trying to obstruct, trying to cover up. I mean, we go on and on and on. And I don't, it doesn't seem like we are getting to what we, we claim we're so concerned about, and that is finding uh, out exactly what happened with regard to Brian Terry and, and how he ended up being killed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, again, I, I said it a few minutes ago, it's so easy for us to sit here and second guess the Attorney General, who's the number one law enforcement officer uh, trying to protect over 300 million people. It's easy to sit back. It's easy to sit back from the chair of the former prosecutor. It's easy. You can make all kinds of decisions. And, you know, people talk about he should know and should Sometimes you don't even know what, what people are doing in your own office. Of 21 people. This guy's got, I mean, people all over the country, in Mexico, ATF. When we went down and we talked to the ATF and we talked to the Mexican people in a bipartisan trip, they said we need some better gun laws. When the whistleblowers, everybody said, oh, we're so concerned about the whistleblowers. Well, what did the whistleblowers say? Their number one concern, they begged, they begged us, get better laws. Do that, do us that favor. And so, you know, come on. I think, again, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If we want to get to the bottom of this, I think we can get to the bottom of this. I think the Attorney General is acting in good faith. I think we ought to try to work with him. And I see that my colleague deserves one some time. I'll yeah. yield. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. Just to respond to the gentleman's uh, email uh, recitation there. Uh, I just want to make clear that what the gentleman was talking about when he said that the, the author of that email said that guns had walked, he was talking about the wide receiver program, not fast and furious. That's how I explain it. And there's a, there's a further clarification here in an email, and he says, first of all, let me clear up the confusion that you noted about the pronouns. When I say it's a tricky case given the number of guns that have walked, I am talking exclusively about wide receiver. That is the only one of the two cases I am aware of at the point in which guns had walked, end quote. And I asked to submit this to the record. Let's see my time is up. The question, oops. the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Does anyone else seek recognition? I'm going to ask for a roll call. 
pursuant the gentleman asked for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is, is ordered and postponed pursuant to committee rules. Does anyone else have an amendment? You have an amendment? Do we? Have, we'll wait on yours if you don't mind. Uh, does the gentlelady have an amendment? Yes. The amendment, clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the report offered by Ms. Maloney of New York. Uh, they, without objection, it could be considered as read. The gentlelady is recognized to explain her amendment as it is being distributed. Thank, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I first would like to be absolutely clear that there is no question that the death of Border Patrol agent uh, Brian Terry was a terrible, terrible tragedy. And there is no question that there were problems with Fast and Furious that it was ill-conceived and poorly executed, as were the three prior uh, programs. But my amendment addresses the Fast and Furious report that, that you have, and it would add language to the report explaining that proceeding to, con to contempt uh, charges at this time is unwarranted uh, because the committee's investigation and the narrative of the contempt citation has serious and glaring flaws. In one of the most significant and partisan decisions of the investigation, the chairman has refused requests, including requests today, to hold a public hearing with Mr. Kenneth Melson, the former head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives the agency responsible for conducting these operations. It seems logical and common sense that we would want to hear from him in a public forum, in a public hearing where all of us are not just reading a transcript, but have a chance to question him. And it is incomprehensible, and I would say unfair, to me that we could be investigating major flaws in an AFT program like this and not call the person responsible, the person who is the head of the ATF, to testify in person before this committee. And I believe that one reason uh, that he has not been called for this may be due to the fact that Mr. Melson's testimony would, would be contrary to the partisan narrative in the contempt citation that we will regrettably be voting on today. Back in July 2011, the committee investigators conducted a transcribed interview, uh, which many of you have referenced today, with Mr. Melson that was closed to the public. And during that interview, Mr. Melson told committee in investigators that he never informed the Attorney General or other senior staff officials at the Justice Department about gun walking during Operation Fast and Furious because he was, quote, unaware of it himself. The key fact is omitted entirely from the contempt citation. And Mr. Melson's statements directly contradict the claim in the contempt citation that senior Justice Department officials were aware of gun walking. The contempt citation asserts that top Justice officials must have been aware of gun walking prior to the public controversy because Gary Grindler, then acting Deputy Attorney General, and I quote, received an extensive briefing on Fast and Furious from Mr. Melson in March of 2010. During his own interview with committee staff, Mr. Grindler confirmed Mr. Melson's account, stating categorically that neither Mr. Melson nor the Deputy Director of ATF, William Hoover, ever raised concerns with him about gun walking in Operation Fast and Furious. Both Mr. Melson and Mr. Hoover told committee staff that gun walking violated agency doctrine, that they did not approve of it, and that they were not aware that ATF agents in Phoenix were using the tactic 
in Fast and Furious. Because they did not know about the use of gun walking in Operation Fast and Furious, they never raised it up the chain of command to senior justice officials. After reviewing over 12,000 pages of documents and interviewing two dozen witnesses and holding three hearings on this matter, the committee has obtained no evidence that the Attorney General or any other high-level Justice Department political appointees authorized, condoned, or approved in any way, shape, or form gun walking. We can all agree that the tactics employed in Fast and Furious and the three prior gun walking operations and prior administrations that occurred under the former administration were absolutely deplorable. Both the investigation and, 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 and this investigation, I, I uh, am very sorry to say, has degenerated into a purely political exercise to tarnish the Attorney General and the President in an election year. And as Juan Williams, a political analyst for Fox News, stated, and I'm not used to quoting Fox News. But, but be brief, please. Your time has expired. This, this contempt citation, this is what he said, and I quote, is a monstrosity breaking apart public trust and dragging the nation's already polarized politics to the bottom of the sea, end quote. So holding someone in contempt is one of the most serious and formal actions Congress can take. And it should not be done as a political weapon against an, an, any administration. And I, 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 thank appeal, the gentlelady. I appeal to my colleagues to support this. This is just report language in the report that reflects the accurate facts. I thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from Utah is recognized in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I rise in opposition to this amendment. I, I don't know how we come up with 12,000 documents. We've been given less than 8,000 of the 140,000 documents. That's at the heart of one of our deep, deep concerns here. Uh, I would also uh, highlight that uh, the acting director of the ATF, Mr. Melson, was appointed by President Obama to that position. He has been since reassigned. Uh, Mr. Melson spent nearly two days before the committee July 4th of 2011 in a bipartisan transcribed interview, which is available uh, for all members of this committee to review. Two things, careful what you, careful what you wish for is always something. Uh, uh, one of the things he said in that uh, transcribed interview is, quote, my view is that the whole matter of the department's response in this case was a disaster, end quote, he meaning the Department of Justice. He went further to say, it is a very frustrating to all of us, and it appears thoroughly to us that the Department of Justice is really trying to figure out a way to push the information away from their political appointees at the Department of Justice, end quote. Uh, I added the justice part in there when he was talking about the department, he was talking about the Department of Justice. These things have been available for 11 months. They are part of the justification for this committee to get to the other documents that would provide and shed further light and information about what is going on in this situation. Well, the gentleman you. Yes. I mean, I, I just want to check with the other side. Is it it's your position that the head of the Phoenix ATF that ran this program should not be called before this committee. No, I'm talking about Mr. Melson, who's the acting director of the of the uh, ATF in right. Washington D.C. is the one that he's been transferred. He, but during this program, he was down there. Uh, yes. With the gentleman yield. Sure. Go ahead. For the record, uh, he was in Washington. He did not run this program. It was an OSADEF program, and he said in his testimony that he, when he went, read the very wiretaps you've all had an opportunity to read, he became sick to his stomach, and that was when he realized they had been gun walking. So uh, again, which program? The the uh, fast, and fast, and yeah. fast and furious. Yeah. Fast and furious. Thank you. Reclaiming my time. It was because of his concern that we are also should be concerned because he gave us this testimony some 11 months ago. Um, I, I think it is important to get to everyone, as, as Mr. Gowdy has cited. Let's go back as far as gun walking has been wrong. It's still wrong. It was always wrong. The Attorney General said this was fundamentally flawed. Doesn't that beg the question then why in February of 2011 we were sent under Department of Justice letterhead 
something that was totally and completely false, something the Department of Justice pulled back some 10 months later. Remember, the senior people, Gary Grindler, as was cited uh, by the gentlewoman, uh, he got a promotion. He's now the, 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 the chief of staff. There haven't been people held accountable for this. There haven't been the adjustments made. My concern is the people who ultimately did approve this are still in the position of power to continue this forward. And if you look at February 4th, you look at Lanny Brewer and what he was doing. The very day that we're sent this totally false letter, he's in, my, in Mexico advocating for gun walking. And he's still the senior most person in this administration in charge of the criminal division. There has not been the accountability that President Obama promised when he did his March 2011 interview with Univision. There haven't been people held accountable. There haven't been the adjustments made. Contrast that with what happened at the Secret Service. Within days, they had taken care of this. And here we are in June of 2012. We didn't want this to be an election year deal. This should have been disposed of in early 2011. And because it has not, we are here today, and we're still spending money, and we are going to follow through with the Brian Terry's family and get to the bottom of this. So please, if you have questions about Mr. Melson's point of view, in a bipartisan way, the staff interviewed him. It's transcribed. There's lots of information. It should not slow down our efforts here today. Mr. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. The question now appears, occurs. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't recognized before when I raised my hand to call the vote. Could I be, could I be recognized? The gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for five minutes. I, 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 I'd like to speak uh, to uh, this amendment. And what I have to say goes also to the Welch Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and virtually everyone who has spoken uh, have indicated that the point here is uh, to find out why Officer, Officer Brian Terry was, was killed. And I want to submit that that's all the public understands. All the discussion here about documents is, is meaningless to those who are watching us today. I'm not saying they are meaningless in and of themselves, mm -hmm. I am saying that Brian Terry is all that, that counts here. Now, my difficulty with the failure to uh, call Mr. Melson so that we could hear from him publicly, uh, with the failure to call the Attorney General, is that if we are interested in getting to the bottom of why Brian Terry was murdered, we cannot allow only a partial story to come forward. We cannot start at the, at the, at the, in the middle when there was a new Justice Department. This is not about they did it too. It's about how did we get into this so we won't get into it again. There is no possibility of understanding how, why, Brian Terry was killed if we're only looking at the back half or part of the story, the story when this attorney general entered the picture, but not the story when the first Justice Department uh, entered the picture. There was a beginning to this story, not just where we are now beginning or near the end. We will never get to the bottom of it by pretending that this is about Fast and Furious and not about its former name, uh, Wide Receiver, well, and the how gentleman... the decision was made in the first place. Would, would the gentlewoman yield? Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to yield. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it's conclusive in the record that it started in 2009. But please, can I also remind the, the gentlewoman, the Mexican government has told us that they believe that there are over 300 people who have been killed, killed, with the guns from Fast and Furious, and that the Attorney General has... We're claiming my time. time. My, if you're not going to, to the point I'm making. The point I am making for the rest of my time is, is that this is not about who struck John in each administration. It is about what you and virtually every member has said. Why was Officer Brian Terry killed? We are entering this story and insisting upon hearing the part of the story that began with a Democratic administration as if there was no beginning to the story. No matter what you are saying about what this Attorney General has done, the fact is we have no information and we have been allowed to question.
none of those who were responsible for beginning this story. I want to make sure no one begins this story again, not just holding accountable the people who inherited the story, the people who stopped the guns, but with, the people who general, started it. With the general lady yeah, here. And, and we are hearing, and so when the Welch Amendment is, is voted down, or perhaps the Maloney Amendment is voted down, you are simply saying once again, uh, as far as we're concerned, a partial story is enough when it comes to finding out why Officer Brian Terry was killed. The only way the public is going to take us seriously is if we look at the whole story, not because we want to blame the Bush administration. Everybody made a mistake here. But the gentleman because again. there is only because there is only one story or there is no story at the all. I again. yield to the gentle lady from New York. I, I, I uh, support her position, and, and we need to look at the full story, and, and we need to call all the people here before us. But I want to come back to my amendment. My amendment goes back to the transcribed interview that everyone talks about, Mr. Melson's statement. And I'm saying that if you proceed with this contempt uh, charge, that the report be accurate and that it reflect what Mr. Melson said that was closed to the public, and I think it, his statements should have been open to the public. But during that interview, he told them that he never informed the Attorney General and other senior officials at the Justice Department about gun walking during Operation Fast and Furious because he was unaware of it himself. I think that should be added in all fairness I, to the report I, I, I that we're moving both, forward I with. think both the gentle ladies, I... As I, as I go to the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, I might remind people that although these are all in order and I'm accepting all amendments, the contempt is only on the refusal to provide a certain period of documents, and it is, does in no way does this end or limit the overall investigation, including many of the points being made. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Chairman, I, I think this latest discussion really goes to the essence of why we need to be able to have access to documents that tell us the full story. Uh, as a former member of the Justice Department, I'm actually not surprised that an acting head of ATF would not have detailed knowledge about the substance of and the tactics of investigations uh, all the way through. In fact, the chain of communication here is what's important. It is the evidence that's being obtained by the, by the investigators on the ground that then goes to the assistant United States attorneys that prepare the affidavits that then go directly to justice, that go to the OEO. They don't get rooted through the head of ATF. They go directly to OTO, the office that oversees the applications for the wiretaps. And so it, it but, but, but the point of it is, with, with, with the limited evidence that we have been able to get, some things have been made very, very clear. And it is that in September 2009, uh, Lanny Brewer, who was in charge of the criminal division, sent a prosecutor from the United States Attorney's Office to Arizona to prosecute ATF cases. The first case that Lanny Brewer chose was the prosecution of Operation Wide Receiver the previous case that had been initiated under the Bush administration. But the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, objecting to the tax used in wide receiver, had previously refused to prosecute the case. So what we have is a denial, but now if we have all the facts, we understand why that individual was being sent by this administration to reopen a case that had already been downturned. And that very person was reporting to James Trustee, who was the criminal division's gang unit head. And this is her language. We only have partial access to a few emails, which is why we need the record. But in the record that we have been able to get, the Assistant Attorney General who was sent, or assistant United States Attorney, sent from Washington to Arizona, she says, 
The case involves 300 to 500 guns. This is the email. It's my understanding that a lot of these guns walked. Whether some or all of them was intentional is not known. So we have that person sent from Washington who's on the ground in Arizona emailing back saying specifically to the Justice Department in Washington, it is my understanding a lot of these guns walked. Now, whether it was intentional or not is not known, and that's the essence of what we're trying to get to, and the essence of why we've asked for these documents, and why the failure to, uh, to, to give us access to these simple things to tell the whole story is the tragedy that's taking place today. I thank the gentleman. Back my time. The question, the, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Baloney. Those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those in favor or those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, and I would ask uh, the uh, chairman's permission that Madam Clerk be permitted to read the amendment in its entirety. Unless there is unanimous consent, the clerk will read the entire amendment. Amendment to the report offered by Mr. Gowdy of South Carolina. Page 4, strike the last sentence of the seventh paragraph and replace with the following. The Department has not provided a privileged do uh, log delineating with particularity why certain documents are being withheld. Page 44, strike the last sentence of the first paragraph under the subheading Document Productions. Page 42, insert after the last paragraph under heading Additional Accommodations by the Committee the following. On June 20, 2012, minutes before the start of the Committee's meeting to consider a resolution holding the Attorney General in contempt, the Committee received a letter from Deputy Attorney General James Cole claiming that the President asserted executive privilege over certain documents covered by the subpoena. The Committee has a number of concerns about the validity of this assertion. One, the assertion was transparently not a valid claim of privilege given its last-minute nature. Two, the assertion was obstructive given that it could have, could have and should have been asserted months ago but was not until literally the day of the contempt markup. Three, the assertion is eight months late. It should have been made by October 25, 2011, the subpoena return date. Four, to this moment the President himself has not indicated that he is asserting executive privilege. Five, the assertion is transparently invalid in that it is not credible that every document withheld involves a communication authored or solicited and received by those members of an immediate White House advisor staff who have broad and significant responsibility for investigating and formulating the advice to be given the President on the particular matter to which the communications relate. Six, the assertion is transparently invalid where the Justice Department has provided no details by which the committee might evaluate the applicability of the pri privilege such as the senders and recipients of the documents. Seven, even if the privilege were valid as an initial matter, which it is not, it certainly has been overcome here as the committee has demonstrated a sufficient need for the documents as they are likely to contain evidence important to the committee's inquiry. And two, the documents sought cannot be obtained any other way. The committee has spent 16 months investigating, talking to dozens of individuals, and collecting documents from many sources. The remaining documents are ones uniquely in the possession of the Justice Justice Department, and eight, without these documents, the committee's, committee's important legislative work will continue to be stymied. The documents are necessary to evaluate what government reform is necessary within the Ju Justice Department to avoid the problems uncovered by the investigation in the future. The President has now asserted executive privilege. This assertion, however, does not change the fact that Attorney General Eric Holder, Jr. is in contempt of Congress today for failing to turn over lawfully subpoenaed documents explaining the Department's role in withdrawing the false letter it sent to Congress. The gentleman is recognized in support of his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I noted parenthetically this morning the uh, evolution of President Obama's position on executive privilege when he was uh, then Senator Obama. He believed that executive privilege was a ruse that presidents hid behind when they did not want to disclose unflattering material. Uh, that may not be a verbatim quote, but it's pretty darn close. Fast forward to uh, this morning, Mr. Chairman, and apparently the President is invoking executive privilege. And I use the word apparently, Mr. Chairman, 
because to my knowledge we still have not heard from the president himself as the chairman knows the privilege belongs to the executive it cannot be asserted by anyone else but let's go with the assumption that he is asserting executive privilege uh, it is curious and legally significant that he did it on the eve of trial so to speak mr chairman this subpoena was issued in october of 2011 eight months ago the return date was october 25 2011 nearly eight months ago he has not deigned to assert that privilege up until today i noted with interest there was some discussion that the attorney general had offered to produce documents last night some documents in exchange for postponement of this hearing uh, that would constitute a waiver and would also be legally significant but mr chairman what strikes me as most significant is uh, unless my recollection is faulty which sometimes it is but i don't think it is in this instance the president and the and the my very fine colleague from utah can correct me if i'm wrong the president told uh, univision well over a year ago he had nothing to do with fast and furious didn't know who approved it i don't believe there's been any allegation mr chairman that the president drafted the february 4th the demonstrably false calculated to mislead and deceive february 4th 2011 letter to senator grassley there's been no allegation that he participated in the drafting or the approving or the delivering of that letter there's been no allegation that he participated to my knowledge in any attempt to cover up the known falsities or that he was part of the decision to withdraw the letter 10 months later so mr chairman i am not sure what he is asserting executive privilege over and for that reason, I want this contempt resolution uh, to make it very clear to the reader that we were aware of what, and in light most favorable to the president, has been his assertion of executive privilege, that we found it to be legally insufficient and wanting, and that we proceeded anyway. Mr. And with would that, I would yield back. Would my colleague yield for a question? I'd be delighted to yield to the gentleman from Virginia. I thank my colleague. And my friend, um, when this committee subpoenaed documents uh, with respect to the then Attorney General, Mr. McQuasey, um, was not executive privilege, in fact, uh, invoked at that time by the Bush administration? Uh, I think executive privilege was asserted when this Congress, which I was not a member of, uh, sought to hold uh, Ms. Meyer, Mr. Bolton, and others in contempt of Congress. Do you remember how the executive privilege was communicated to this committee? Um, I take it by your question that it was on the eve of the contempt vote, but I don't know. I was a prosecutor back in those days. I, I, I believe the uh, in invocation of executive privilege was conveyed to this committee precisely in the same manner that this one has been by letter from the Department of Justice, not by a separate letter or signature well, by the, the President. The, as the gentleman from Virginia raises a very good point, and my friend, I hasten to add, from Virginia raises a very good point. It was, um, I think, when I was 11 or 12 that the defense of but others are doing it stopped working in my household. I don't know what took place before I got here, but it also goes to the bigger issue of, of, and there have been some thinly veiled accusations on the other side that we're attempting to cover or don't want um, information about the Bush administration to come out. I, I could not have been clearer this morning. I want every piece of information to come out irrespective of who the Attorney General was. If there's anything that should rise above petty partisan politics, it should be respect for the rule of law and appreciation for our criminal justice system. But I cannot possibly imagine what the former attorney generals had to do with the drafting of the February 4th, 2011 letter. Unless there's been an allegation that Attorney General Gonzalez or Mukasey was part of the drafting of a February 4th, 2011 letter, what does that have to do with our vote today? Unless they were part of withholding documents from Congress, what does that have to do with what we're doing today? Well, and with that, I see my time's run out. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts in opposition. Thank you very much. So I know we've talked a lot today about uh, former Attorney General Michael Mukasey, uh, and I want to do it once more, but in a different context on that. I, I want to read a quote from Mr. Mukasey, uh, 
from 2008, when he was writing then about a justification for then-President George W. Bush to exert an executive privilege over the Environmental Protection Agency documents uh, pertaining to the agency's proposed ozone regulation. And I know that others are doing it, too, isn't an excuse in your household or mine, but when people write a legal opinion and they're attorneys general, then many times people either agree or disagree with it, but it's an attorney general's opinion, and it gives uh, not somebody taking an excuse that others were doing it, but saying that there's, in at least some people's mind, a legal uh, explanation for why it's done. This is what uh, Mr. McKenzie wrote, and I quote, the doctrine of executive privilege also encompasses executive branch deliberative communications that do not implicate presidential decision making. As the Supreme Court has explained, the privilege recognizes, and he quotes, the valid need for protection of communications between high government officials and those who advise and assist them in the performance of their manifold duties. And he stops his quote there. Going back to Mr. McKenzie's comments, based on this principle, the Justice Department under administrations of both political parties has concluded repeatedly that the privilege may be invoked to protect executive branch deliberations against congressional subpoenas. So the claim seems pretty similar to the ones that we are asserting here today. This administration is apparently not saying that it had a privilege necessarily that it's in, uh, protecting, but that those who are uh, protecting, those high government officials who are being advised and assisted in the performance it is that protection that they are seeking on that. So we have heard a, a number of claims otherwise. That seems to be what is there. Back when this was brought to then Chairman Waxman's uh, attention, he disagreed with it, as, as you apparently disagree with it today. But he did uh, decide that he would delay the contempt vote until he had time to, re to review the assertion uh, and then to see how to proceed on that. And I think, you know, where we have a constitutional obligation that has been referenced a number of times here today to try to reach out some accommodation between the two branches. And because there seems to be quite a bit of uncertainty as to just how this President is invoking it here, uh, although I think now in context of this it seems pretty clear that he's invoking it for the, uh, the Department itself, but it might make some sense to put this off, especially where the Attorney General has said that he will produce documents, that he will spend the time to go over with the Committee Chair and others to explain the documents and to get uh, the information before the Committee that needs to be there. Um, I think you know, we've got a lot of the documents there we found out from the chairman was admittedly looking for documents that couldn't be produced. We've got all the way down to this very narrow set of documents now. Well, would the gentleman, would the gentleman yield for one second? I thought if I could on that. So we've got to the very narrow set of documents. We've got an individual saying that he'll produce them and, and come in and explain them or whatever. And that an executive privilege has been invoked apparently under something that at least previous administrations have agreed with. It does not mean that he had to have knowledge or that he's actually I uh, had the statement that is being protected on that, but that people in his administration have. It would be appropriate to put this off perhaps for a week or so and get to the bottom of this and let the Attorney General have a go at uh, satisfying the committee. I will yield to you now. I, I thank the gentleman. I just want to make sure we make two things clear. First of all, there were not things that we asked for that were inappropriate. We never asked for the, uh, anything that was going to be law enforcement sensitive that would compromise an existing uh, investigation uh, or prosecution. We made it very clear that although it may be covered by a subpoena, we were not looking for those. And that is one of the reasons we didn't look for those documents. Secondly, the Attorney General's offer that if I cease in advance in order to get I, I a briefing back, I, I, is I, I, not, in I, I, fact, discovery. That. That's your interpretation of the meeting that other people had quite differently and, and frankly, one that doesn't seem reasonable to me that he would make that sense, that claim. And, and, having heard, and where are the documents? And having heard of the ranking member's uh, account of the meeting at all, it seems that it was quite clear that the representation was made that he would prepare some documents and explain things and give you an accounting of what documents he might not be able to prepare and a listing of why, that there should be an accommodation made to give that, uh, that opportunity to, to occur. But you know, that is uh, just, I, I guess, a suggestion of how we might proceed reasonably on this and less politically. But um, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. For, uh, I now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, we have just received a statement from Brian Terry's family. And I think as we debate these amendments and we talk about holding the uh, Attorney General in contempt of Congress. I think it's very important that we continue to put a face on the life that was lost. And I think it's very uh, fitting that we hear from his family during I'd ask unanimous consent that the statement from the Terry family be placed in the record without objection, so ordered. The statement came from the Terry family attorney, Pat McGroder. Release, he released the following statement. 
Attorney General Eric Holder's refusal to fully disclose the documents associated with Operation Fast and Furious and President Obama's assertion of ex executive privilege serves to compound this tragedy. It denies the Terry family and the American people the truth. Our son, Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry, was killed by members of a Mexican drug cartel armed with weapons from this failed Justice Department gun trafficking investigation. For more than 18 months, we have been asking our federal government for justice and accountability. The documents sought by the House Oversight Committee and associated with Operation Fast and Furious should be produced and turned over to the committee. Our son lost his life protecting this nation, and it is very important that we are now faced with an administration that seems more concerned with protecting themselves rather than revealing the truth beyond Operation Fast and Furious. I yield back my time. Generally, I yield back. The question now is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. A, recording, a recorded vote is ordered. Uh, with that, I ask unanimous consent that the previous uh, amendment uh, voted down by voice vote be set aside and that a recorded vote be ordered on the amendment offered from the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. Without objection, so ordered. We now return to previously postponed amendments. And with that, I, I, called, I ask to call the roll on the Welsh Amendment. Mr. Issa? No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Burton? Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Turner? I'm sorry, Mr. Platts? Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. McHenry? Mr. Jordan? No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Mack? No. Mr. Mack votes no. Mr. Wahlberg? Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Langford? Mr. Langford votes no. Mr. Mosh? Mr. Mosh votes no. Ms. Burkle? Ms. Burkle votes no. Dr. Gosar? Dr. Gosar votes no. Mr. Labrador? Mr. Labrador votes no. Mr. Meehan? No. Mr. Meehan votes no. Dr. Desjardins? No. Mr. De uh, Dr. Desjardins votes no. Mr. Walsh? No. Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Gowdy? Mr. Gowdy votes no. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Ginta? Mr. Ginta votes no. Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. T uh, Cummings? Yes. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Ms. Maloney? Aye. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch? Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Murphy? Ms. Spear? Aye. Ms. Spear votes aye. Mr. Mr. Kucinich? You're not recorded. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. How am I recorded? You are not, sir. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Uh, McHenry? McHenry votes no. Mr. McHenry votes no. Does anyone else seek recognition? Mr. Murphy? Mr. Uh, Mercy, Mr. Murphy votes aye. The clerk will report. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes, 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. We now call the roll on the Lynch Amendment. <coughs> on which it was previously postponed. Yes, Mr. Issa. No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Bur uh, Micah votes no. Mr. Platts? No. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. McHenry? Mr. McHenry votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Mack? Mr. Mack votes no. Mr. Wahlberg? Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Langford? Mr. Langford votes no. Mr. Mosh? Mr. Mosh votes no. Ms. Burkle? Ms. Burkle votes no. Mr. Gosar? Mr. Gosar votes no. Mr. Labrador? Mr. Labrador votes no. Mr. Meehan? No. 
Mr. Meehan votes no. Dr. Desjardins? No. Dr. Desjardins votes no. Mr. Walsh? No. Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Gowdy? No. Mr. Gowdy votes no. Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Ginta? Mr. Ginta votes no. Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Cummings? Yes. Ms. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Yes. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Clay vo votes aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Aye. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch? Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Ms. Spear? Aye. Ms. Spear votes aye. The clerk will report. On the vote, Mr. Chairman, 15 ayes, 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The question now occurs on the amendment offered by the lady from New York, Ms. Maloney, in which the uh, noes uh, prevailed by voice and a recorded vote was ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa. No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Burton. No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Micah. No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. McHenry? No. Mr. McHenry votes no. Mr. Jordan? No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Chaffetz? No. Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Mack? No. Mr. Mack votes no. Mr. Wahlberg? Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Mr. Langford? Mr. Langford votes no. Mr. Amash? Mr. Amash votes no. Ms. Burkle? Ms. Burkle votes no. Dr. Gosar? No. Dr. Gosar votes no. Mr. Labrador? No. Mr. Labrador votes no. Mr. Meehan? No. Mr. Meehan votes no. Dr. Desjardins? No. Dr. Desjardins votes no. Mr. Walsh? No. Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Gowdy? Mr. Gowdy votes no. Mr. Ross? No. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Ginta? Mr. Ginta votes no. Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes aye. Ms. Maloney? Aye. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Yes. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Yes. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Yes. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth? I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Welch? Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Murphy? Mr. Murphy votes aye. Ms. Spear? Aye. Ms. Spear votes aye. The clerk will report. That vote, Mr. Chairman, 16 ayes, 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The clerk will not, or see, we will now proceed to the amendment previously uh, passed, passed by voice vote on which a recorded vote was asked for and delayed. The clerk will report or, re, or call the roll on the Gowdy amendment. Mr. Issa? Aye. Mr. B Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Platts? Mr. Platts votes aye. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. McHenry. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Mack. Mr. Mack votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Amash. Mr. Amash votes aye. Ms. Burkle. Ms. Burkle votes aye. Dr. Gosar. Dr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador. Aye. Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Dr. Desjardins. Yes. Dr. Dejale votes aye. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Walsh votes aye. Mr. Gowdy? Yes. Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Ginta? Aye. Mr. Ginta votes aye. Mr. Farenthold? Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Ms. Maloney? I'm sorry. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton? It's really a good amendment, but does the gentleman wish to change his vote? <laughs> I did. No. Uh, no.
Mr. Towns Vote votes no. no. Ms. Norton. You're no. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper votes no. Mr. Connolly. No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. I'm. Mr. Welch, I'm sorry, I keep skipping you. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Yarmouth is here. <laughs> Mr. Yarmouth votes no. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Beer. Ms. Beer votes no. The clerk will report. On that vote, there are 23 ayes, 17 noes. The amendment is agreed to. A quorum being present, the question is on favorable reporting the contempt report of the House as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those, op those opposed, no. No. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa. Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton. Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Platts. Aye. Mr. Platts votes aye. Mr. Turner. Aye. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. McHenry. Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Aye. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Mack. Aye. Mr. Mack votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg. Aye. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford. Yes. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Amash. Yes. Mr. Amash votes aye. Ms. Burkle. Yes. Ms. Burkle votes aye. Dr. Gosar. Aye. Dr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador. Aye. Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Dr. Desjardins? Yes. Dr. Desjardins votes aye. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Walsh votes aye. Mr. Gowdy? Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Ross? Aye. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Ginta? Aye. Mr. Ginta votes aye. Mr. Farenthold? Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Mrs. Maloney? No. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? No. Mr. Cooper votes no. Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? No. Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch? No. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Yarmouth? No. Mr. Yarmouth votes no. Mr. Murphy? No. Mr. Murphy votes no. Ms. Beer? No. Ms. Beer votes no. The clerk will report. 23 ayes, 17 noes. The ayes have it. And a contempt report is ordered to, uh, ordered, reported to the House. Without objection, the staff shall be authorized to make necessary and technical corrections and conforming changes to the report. Mr. Um, Chairman, I ask for the representative days to uh, file. For, to file your report? Yes. Without objection, so ordered, the committee stands adjourned.